Hello and welcome to the channel. On the 15th of April 1991, John Tanner was making his way back home to Nottingham after spending the weekend with his girlfriend Rachel McLean. While returning home by train, he wrote a letter to Rachel thanking her for a wonderful weekend and expressing his love for her. However, it was a letter that Rachel would never read. Today's case looks at the tragic demise of Rachel McLean and how police uncovered the shocking truth behind her murder and what has happened in the years since. If you have an interest in content like this, please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell to ensure you never miss an upload. And so without further ado, let's begin. Our story today takes place in Oxford, England. The city of Oxford is home to approximately 152,000 people. It's perhaps best known for being the home to the University of Oxford, one of England's most prestigious universities, whose rowing team competes against Cambridge University in the annual boat race. In 1991, Oxford was home to St Hilda's college student Rachel McLean, Rachel was born in 1971 in Blackpool to parents Malcolm and Joan. Malcolm was a British aerospace engineer, whereas Joan was head of foreign language at Hodgson High School in Poulton le -Fylde. Of the three children Joan and Malcolm had, Rachel was their firstborn. She would have two younger brothers, David and Peter. Before joining St Hilda's College in 1989 to study English, Rachel attended Blackpool Sixth Form College, where the head of literature would describe her as a, quote, splendid student, end quote. Friends would also describe Rachel as an intelligent, bright and bubbly person. At St Hilda's College, Rachel would be elected vice president of her college junior common room, as well as being a member of the Oxford Union and Industrial Society. A staunch Christian and vegetarian, Rachel also gave back to her community by volunteering at Samaritans and Christian Aid. At the time, Rachel was in a long-distance relationship with a man named John Tanner. The pair initially met when in 1990, Rachel travelled back to Blackpool on her 19th birthday to celebrate with friends and family. While out, she met John who was working at the Adam and Eve bar that Rachel and her friends visited. John Tanner was born in Hampshire, but his parents were originally from New Zealand. At an early age, John returned to New Zealand with his parents, but came back to England in 1986 and would stay until 1989, where he returned back to New Zealand. However, after just three months, he came back to England again to enrol at Nottingham University, where he would learn classical studies. He also hosted a radio show called the Fast Lane at the university that aired twice a week. He was elected the student union representative for the Sherwood Hall of Residence. He was a keen footballer and was generally well liked and a popular person. The pair, who both shared a keen interest in heavy metal music, instantly hit it off and entered into quite an intense relationship with Rachel and John often traveling on weekends to see each other as well as writing to each other regularly. Although more than 100 miles separated the pair, they seemed to make this arrangement work. On the 13th of April 1991, John travelled from Nottingham to spend the weekend with Rachel. It was a couple of weeks since the Easter holidays and her roommates had not yet returned. She waited for him at the train station, as the plan was to meet up at 6pm. However, John was running late and she would eventually return home. John would later arrive to her home at 7.30pm by taxi. The next day, the couple stayed at home as Nottingham Forest were due to play West Ham in the FA Cup semi-final. John, an avid Forest fan, watched his side win 4-0 against the Hammers, while Rachel studied in the front room. On the 15th of April, John had to go back to Nottingham, after boarding the 6.30pm train from Oxford Station, 
he penned a letter to Rachel, where he wrote the following. My dearest lovely Rachel, thank you for such a wonderful weekend. Please excuse the handwriting, as I am now sadly wending my way away from your smiling face. Fancy seeing that friend of yours at the station. It was nice of him to give you a lift, but I hate him because he has longer hair than me. It's nice to know you will not be alone for the next few days. I worry for you in that house on your own. He would post the letter to Rachel on the 16th of April 1991, but she would never get the chance to read it. On the same day he posted the letter to Rachel, John phoned his girlfriend's home, but there was no answer. The following day he called again and spoke with one of Rachel's friends, Victoria Clare, who informed him that she wasn't at home. He pressed her on where she was, but Claire reiterated that she had no idea. He'd write another letter to Rachel, indicating a sense of frustration at not being able to speak with her. My dearest darling Rachel, I have tried calling you a week, but I guess you are working. A call would be appreciated. Being without you is a terrible burden to bear. Please write or call soon. I love you, Rachel, now and forever. I miss you, love. Your John. Rachel's friends would begin to grow concerned as to her whereabouts, but assured themselves that she may be staying with friends or family, possibly taking time away to study. But when she failed to show up to a meeting scheduled with her tutor on the morning of the 19th of April, where she was due to discuss the new term and sit a preterm exam, college authorities would contact the police. Initially, the search was quite low-key, but by the 21st of April, the Criminal Investigation Department, or CID, took on the case, and a search was then carried out at her home. Police found nothing had been taken from her room, and there was no obvious sign that anything untoward had occurred at the residence. They then spoke with her roommates, who described the intense relationship Rachel had with John. Particularly, they would describe a side to the relationship that caused police to put John at the top of their suspect list. You see, while John was for all intents and purposes an intelligent, popular, well-liked man, his long-distance relationship with Rachel began to stir up a jealous side to his personality. The thought of Rachel being such a long distance away would eat at him, and he would regularly call Rachel to learn where she had been, who she had been with, and what she had been wearing. This caused the couple to argue almost daily on the telephone and by letter. Rachel's friends also provided the police with the two letters that John had sent, and this further caused alarm bells to ring. The fact that John was happy to leave Rachel with another man, despite his jealous streak, didn't sit well with the investigators. They also learned that Rachel was last seen by neighbours at around 4.30pm outside with John on the 14th of April. By the 22nd of April, Rachel's disappearance had been made public, and police visited John at his Nottingham home to gather a witness statement. He described that on Monday the 15th, he woke up at approximately midday and found Rachel studying. At about 4.15pm, the couple set off to Oxford train station together, getting there by bus, which he said they both hopped on at around 5pm. While waiting for John's train, the two had coffee at the train station cafe. It was here that an unnamed friend of Rachel's bumped into the two and joined them. He described the man as having long dark hair and wearing clothes similar to his own. He said the last time he saw Rachel was after embracing and kissing her goodbye. He then got on the train and left her with this mysterious person. John also provided investigators with an e-fit of the long-haired man to circulate. This statement wasn't enough for John to escape the watch for live investigators. After his witness statement, Two officers were assigned to him under the guise of supporting him throughout the investigation. However, their real intention was to monitor John for any slip-ups that he might make. 
friends were concerned with John's overall behaviour after returning to Nottingham. Despite his girlfriend now being missing for several days, John was behaving as though nothing was wrong and continued life as normal back at home. As interest in Rachel's disappearance grew, so did the media presence around John. With all fingers of suspicion pointing towards John Tanner, there was one small problem. There wasn't a single piece of evidence tying him to Rachel's disappearance. As a result, police looked to form an unlikely alliance with the media in the hopes of catching him out in a lie. John Tanner agreed to attend a press conference where he would appeal for the safe return of Rachel. Not wanting to be seen as the bad guys, the police had essentially arranged with the media beforehand to ask John direct questions at the end to see how he would react to their pressing him on his involvement. Throughout the press conference, John cut a calm and composed figure, something that you wouldn't normally expect from someone whose lover had mysteriously vanished without trace. At one point, he even brazenly admitted that there were certain things about Rachel that he didn't like. Then as planned, towards the end of the press conference, the media asked John the following. You know, aware of anything that's sinister that's happened to Rachel involved yourself? Not at all, no. Not to my knowledge. As, you, as far as you're concerned, you're quite clear in your mind that you, last, you went on the train and that was it and you don't know anything more about it? Absolutely. In your heart of hearts, do you think Rachel's still alive? In my heart of hearts, I like to think so. John's mannerisms and answers he gave didn't convince anybody investigating that he wasn't involved, and even some of his friends began to doubt John's innocence. Still without evidence, police took things a step further and created a reconstruction using a female officer playing Rachel an unnamed actor as the man John claimed as being present at the station that day, and John Tanner being played by John Tanner himself. Like before, the reconstruction was put out there to analyse John's behaviour, but it was also to see if anyone from the public would come forward to share anything they saw. Thankfully, a woman named Jane Wynne Jones saw the reconstruction and spoke with police but what she said flew in the face of what John had stated had taken place. She recalled seeing John at the train station around the time John said he was there. However, she only saw John. No mysterious long-haired man and no Rachel. She noted that he seemed to be shuffling and fidgeting a lot, and at one point, he reached into his bag and pulled out a pen and notepad and began writing into it. This would end up being the letter he sent Rachel while he claimed he was on the train at the time. Another breakthrough came when the police followed up with the bus company to confirm John's claim that both he and Rachel boarded the bus together. A review of the computer systems found that at the time John boarded, only one single fare ticket had been purchased. By now, police were absolutely convinced that Rachel was dead. However, they had still not found her in-depth searches in lakes and woodlands revealed nothing, and so the only place they thought Rachel could be was still in her Argyle Street home. The floor plans of the property were retrieved from Oxfordshire County Council, and it was discovered that there was underpinning at the property, which caused 8-inch cavities underneath the floors. On the 2nd of May 1991, 18 days after Rachel McLean was last seen, another search at the property was conducted. The floorboards were removed, and there was the lifeless body of Rachel. John Tanner was arrested the same day at the White Hart pub in Nottingham, and he was taken in for questioning. Initially, he sat in silence as police grilled him over Rachel's murder, but as they ramped up the interrogation and presented the evidence to him, John eventually caved in. He told interrogators that shortly before she was killed, Rachel had agreed to marry him on Valentine's Day. But on the night of her murder, she told John that she no longer wished to be with him, telling John that she'd been seeing another man. John said in his statement that he was left offended and that his mind had snapped. 
The next thing he knew, his hands were around Rachel's throat. She had been strangled. After pondering what to do for several hours, he decided to hide Rachel underneath the floorboards before making his way back to Nottingham. Despite admitting to killing Rachel, he never admitted to murder, instead arguing that it was a case of diminished responsibility. As such, John Tanner went to trial for the murder of Rachel McLean. The trial, which took place in December 1991 at Birmingham Crown Court, Tanner amazingly portrayed himself as a victim, hoping to convince jurors that he was not at fault for her death. He claimed Rachel would taunt him if he was unable to perform sexually and insisted that he never intended to kill her. During the trial, Rachel's diary was read out to demonstrate John's possessive and controlling nature over her. In particular, on Valentine's Day 1990, Rachel wrote John a Valentine's card which read as follows. To my one and only John. To the man who has made me feel like a woman once more. Who lights my fire and who burns with me. Who takes me to the places of which I'd only dreamed. You are, you will always be, my Valentine. But a diary note entered the same day would tell another story. Just finished writing John's Valentine's card. Shoveling out rubbish from a fire which has dried and cracked within me. Somehow I don't think you would have appreciated sweet nothings along the lines of, you sick childish bastard. Hope your romance, with yourself, lasts forever and ever. John's defence case would also fall into tatters when it was proved that after strangling Rachel, he then went and gathered a tea towel, came back and used it as a ligature to complete the murder. Furthermore, his claims that Rachel was seeing another man was untrue. While we'll never know whether she actually said it, if she did, it was most likely a way to provide an excuse for John to definitively leave the relationship. On the 6th of December 1991, it took a jury just four and a half hours to find John guilty of the murder of Rachel McLean by a 10 to 2 majority. He was handed a life sentence Although in the summer of 2003, just under 12 years into this sentence, John was released from prison and deported back to New Zealand, where he would go on to live in the city of Whanganui. John's story incredibly doesn't end there. In 2018, he was back in the media limelight, this time in New Zealand, after it emerged that he had been abusing his partner, who was unnamed, over a six-month period. During this period of abuse, there were echoes of the violence he committed upon Rachel, most notably one occasion where he lost control and placed his hands around her throat, restricting her breathing. The possibility of returning him to the UK to complete the rest of his life sentence was looked at, but was not possible due to the abuse taking place in New Zealand. Instead, he was sentenced to two years and nine months in prison. The unnamed victim at the time stated that she was standing by him. For her sake, I hope she decided otherwise. Thank you for watching. If you find content like this informative, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel, as well as hitting the notification bell so you never miss an upload. I've also launched a second channel where I'll be live streaming additional content, such as crime related gameplay. I've left the link in the description, so feel free to subscribe to That Crime Guy Live as well. Until next time, take care and goodbye. For now.